my pleasure to introduce Mark Thomas Gibson. Mark is an artist whose work, in the words of Ridley Howard of the Huffington Post, plays with the language of comics and pulls it into painting. His work's been exhibited at Salon 94 and Joshua Liner Gallery in New York, Abel Baker Contemporary in Portland, Ms. Barber in LA, Anahita Art Gallery in Tehran, and Modus Fort in Tokyo. He's represented here in New York by Fredericks and Freiser, where he's had two solo exhibitions. In 2016, Mark uh, curated the exhibition Black Pulp at Yale University's Edgewood Center, which later traveled to the International Print Center in New York. Mark is a full-time lecturer at Yale and has also taught at the Cooper Union, at Rutgers, and at the Yale Norfolk Summer School of Art and Music. Mark received a BFA from the Cooper Union in 1998 and an MFA from Yale School of Art in Painting and Printmaking. We're so happy to have Mark on faculty here at SVA. Please join me in welcoming Mark Thomas Gibson. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, first, let me say thank you to Mark and to SVA um, and to the community of SVA. My, for the last year or so, I've been working with you, and it's been a real honor. I found so, well, I've had so many incredible, incredible experiences actually working with the students, and you've shown me a lot. Um, also, just to say about Mark, Mark has actually been a very, very, very powerful friend for me for the last couple of years, and he actually means a lot to me as a human being. And I hope I don't mess that up tonight. So, <laughs> so um, I call this talk Manifest Destiny, a love story. And it really kind of tracks the work that I started doing while I was in grad school and uh, to what I'm doing now. And it's a little bit about this idea of how simple ideas, things that kind of come into your life, how they can actually like plant like little seeds and they grow over time and they influence what you do um, throughout the rest of your life, or at least for my life so far. So this is Mr. Benjamin Franklin. Um, many of you may know that Benjamin Franklin uh, did the whole kite experiment and found electricity and Benjamin Franklin had that T like, no, did a glasses bifocals. He also had a really amazing stove. Um, but he's also, Benjamin Franklin was a real big liar and he was a self promoter and he didn't really actually do the electricity experiment. Actually, it was a uh, French guy who did like six months before him and then he doctored the paperwork and he actually had his bastards bastard actually help him with the experiment when he did do it. Um, and I say that to say, I, I think about these people and, and the books that I've read about individuals, because I do read a lot about American history, and you start to find that there's a lot of polish to things. There's not actually, like, where's truth? Um, I, I, I mean, yeah, okay, we're talking about that now because we've got Donald Trump and he's, you know, whatever. And, but I think about that a lot, and I've have thought about that a lot in my life. And so when I first came to, to Yale, and hell, when I moved to the Northeast, I was actually kind of surprised how um, pale everyone was. Okay, I'm originally from Miami, Florida. Woo! And um, Carroll City, do you know Carroll City? Uh, oh, you're Carroll City, that's nice. All right, gotta say it like that, the voice goes up. Um, so coming from Miami, Florida, and a place where it's warm, and people are warm, and colors are warm, and everyone eats fruit, I ended up moving to the north where everyone eats bread and it's pale and it's soups. And I, I started like looking at people and actually looking at their faces and looking at their skin and looking at what wear and tear does to people in this kind of cold environment. And, and not until I was in grad school did I actually like stop and look at this painting and realize like this is him like when he's in his 60s living in the like northeast. Like why does he look so smooth? Like why does he look so clean? Why does he look so fresh? And, it just kind of bugged me. It just like started to like this little inkling of like what painting can do, how painting can hide things, how painting can masquerade and, and create like false uh, narratives for people. So I actually, I started going back and reading the autobi autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. It was something I'd read when I was in undergrad. I had a professor, Peter Buckley, who was an, uh, a great American historian. Um, 
and he still teaches, I believe, at Cooper Union, and he really had a great way of unpacking information and kind of telling you like how things were kind of full of it. And so going back and actually looking at my um, edition that I had in undergrad, I started seeing all the underlying statements and all the, the jokes and how he was just, you know, he talks about like when he first comes to Philadelphia, all he has is like a, you know, a just clothes and a one loaf of bread and he sees this poor woman on the side of the street and he ends up giving her a loaf of bread and, and then later, four years later, that ends up being his wife. You know, like that kind of stuff, which is actually BS. So, yeah, look at that. So smooth. <coughs> Baby smooth. So, I started looking at this idea of how articulating narrative in a painting by creating fantasy, how, how quickly that just kind of slips in, how people kind of take that for granted. Um, it's something to really actually think about now. I, 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 I kind of go back to this girlfriend I had when I was in high school, and one day we were driving in the car, and I was kind of going off about like images of Jesus Christ, and that's not what Jesus looked like, and da 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 da, and you know, burnt copper penny skin and hair of wool, and got going all into that, and she's like, "What do you mean? Like he was obviously a white guy," and I was just like, "What do you What do you mean?" And he's like, "Well, look at all the paintings," and I was just like, "I'm like, do you do know those weren't made in the time of his life, right?" And it was like a pause. And I was like, okay, that's over. This relationship's done. Um, <laughs> but you have those moments when you actually have to wake up to what is reality. You have to have um, this synthesis between you and another human being sometimes to understand what reality is. You actually have to engage another person to understand what reality is. And I think for me, when looking at someone like him, I wanted to bring that conversation back to the forefront that he's not just a guy on money, but he's actually a person who, his, okay, people talk about how Benjamin Franklin actually hated slavery. He hated slavery because he didn't like what slavery was actually doing in the Caribbean. He felt slavery was actually making white people weak and making them less than and actually was mutating them into a lesser race of people. So he felt that slavery actually needed to be a lot more strict and a lot more divided and you shouldn't actually, it has to be, just let's say he was not a cool guy in that. Um, so this is my first uh, Venn painting. It was done while I was in my second year of school. I struggled a lot, I guess, in the first year I was there. I had all these ideas about making a thousand paintings and, and overworking myself, and my color sense was horrible. And it, it just goes on and on. And so I, I stopped, and I kind of slowed down, and I, I started looking at this process that Ad Reinhardt used to use for paintings. So this is actually a pumped up version of this painting. Uh, typically it's a lot blacker and you basically barely make them out, but for the case of talks, I kind of pumped it up a little bit more. And I just wanted this, this painting, similar to like an, um, an Ad Reinhardt painting, where it kind of burns into the, your eye. The idea of who the person is, the individual, actually has to slowly come into your awareness rather than you just taking it for granted. And I found that when I actually created the painting and I would watch people look at it, I would actually hear people start talking about like, what they knew about Benjamin Franklin. And I'd hear people contradict each other about what they knew about Benjamin Franklin. So in some way, I was kind of getting it for the first time. I was getting people to actually have a conversation. Um, and I didn't really understand at the time that's what I was looking for, but it, that's what started to happen. Um, this one I call Poser Ben. Um, it's, a, it's a rendition of a painting of Ben Franklin when he was going to the French court. And basically on the way there, he got himself like a, a marmot hat. And um, so they could sit in the French court and it looked like he was actually like a, a crazy American because the idea of Benjamin Franklin for the French was that he was a wild man, that he was like a guy who was like living in the, like in the forest of America. And he was like so intelligent and somehow out of that, the, the, the detritus of America, he, here comes a shining light of intelligence. Um, so he, on the way over, he, I guess he was going through French Canada and he got himself a hat off a trader and then put it on so he could look the part. Um, so this is, a, this is the first time I actually kind of transformed someone into a werewolf in my work. So I kind of was playing with Benjamin Franklin, catching lightning in this one. Yeah, werewolves, we'll get into that. So this is about like how the phrase manifest destiny was actually coined in 1845. And it was to promote the annexation of Texas and Oregon country to the United States. And that idea of manifest destiny is that our global, it, it, manifest destiny is not just our, 
continental agenda, it's our global agenda as a culture and as a country, is that it's God-given, that we're special and we can do what we want with other people and we can put other people where we want to put other people when we want to put them there. And my mother's from Austin, Texas, and I do have like Mexican heritage in my family, and I think a lot about that space, especially Texas as a space where people so proudly talk and speak of Texas, which is just like, for me, stolen land. And I just am always kind of like, how can you look at the history of something that just happened? You know, 1845 is not that long ago, and, and, and then have such pride in something, and, and, and the claim that you own this, and own what was these, this, other, this other land, this other country. So another great lie is uh, Washington Crossing the Delaware. So Washington Crossing the Delaware is a painting by Emanuel Lutz made in 1850 to commemorate the actual crossing of the Delaware and the, uh, the revolution. The painting, if you've seen it, right? Like you've been to the Met, you've seen this big, massive uh, piece of propaganda. It's, uh, it's a painting that was rendered and it's actually made to kind of talk about the different people in America. So here you have a black man and then you have a Scot and this is actually a woman in the back you have a Native American who's on the rudder of the ship and it's about like all the people in America coming together to help like George Washington on Christmas Eve, very biblical, um, cross over and to fight the Hessians on the shores of Delaware, uh, Delaware River. And uh, of course, that's all BS. The boats look nothing like that. They were kind of like makeshift rafts. There's, there's this weird kind of light that kind of comes into the painting. And there's something about the painting, the fact that he's actually moving west that is actually kind of interesting to think about like this provenance and this idea that he's actually moving towards the light, he's moving towards what is God given, he's moving to what is America, he's, he's creating America at this moment. That painting is actually a duplicate of a painting. This is the original painting. It was destroyed in Germany during World War II, bombed out by us, funny. Um, it was on loan to them. Lutz actually made many copies of Washington Crossing the Delaware and it was, they were sent around the world as a form of propaganda to kind of like, like spend, spread the idea of America and what America meant. And so I, I was you know, curious about that, and I, so I decided to make my own version of it with like these uh, kind of like mouse-like people going over the side of a, a waterfall. It was a painting about eight foot by 10. Um, and it was like my first attempt to truly try to see how I could try to master this technique with this material. I mean, there's so many things about this painting when I look at it now, I'm like, ugh, but, <laughs> that hand. Um, but I wanted to really like, like hit it on its head, and if anything, it's kind of strange when I look at it now, I realize that the cartooning kind of starts here um, in the painting. When I start to think about like the outside, almost like Monty Python hand, like coming inside of it and kind of directing, like is he directing them or is it actually gonna crab them and like pull them away? So I kind of, the humor started to kind of play a role a little bit more than it had before. I made other large things. These were like uh, nine foot by six foot. They're like these kind of glitter paper pieces made with um, printer ink, really lethal stuff. It was really dumb of me. I was like misting it in the space and getting these really amazing colors like in the background and the surrounding area. Um, this one is uh, basically everyone going over the side of uh, a waterfall on the, on the, on the George Washington ship. Um, this one's called Westward. It's basically about like soldiers. I think there's a couple hundred soldiers that I drew in there. And it's like the spirit of Manifest Destiny, which for me started to become this kind of wolf, um, kind of connecting it to a form of Buddhism that describes like the hungry ghost and this idea of like satiation, the idea of never being full. Um, addiction is kind of also tied to the idea of the hungry ghost. And the idea of making it a werewolf is really, because when you think about Vampires and their kiss, the vampire's kiss is a loving act or kind of sexual, you know? I mean, it's okay, it's not really loving, it's kind of messed up. But he, you know, it's, there's something there that kind of happens and there's a transformation that occurs and it's all kind of like mutual. It's kind of this engagement like, will, will I, won't I, will I, won't I? In the case of a werewolf, you're walking home one night, a giant beast comes and it rips you apart, eats half of your body and then you survive. And then you kind of pick yourself up and then, and then, you, then a month later you turn into that thing. So it's just, there's a violence that's there that comes in with a werewolf and that curse. There's a real transformation of the body, the mind, and the soul on a deeper level and that you actually have the trauma of actually enacting it monthly. 
And then you become the one who creates that violence in other people. You become the one who actually spreads that violence. So, so a lot of, that's kind of a major theme for me and how I kind of think about our culture in a lot of ways, that all of us have had something happen to us here in this country, in this culture, that has positioned us in such a way that we see ourselves in a very specific way and we do violence and we do harm to other people, not even consciously, you know. We just do it because it's kind of our role, it's kind of our systematized role inside of our society. So I make werewolves, all right. So this piece was about 12 by 14. It was a uh, glitter, it no longer is with us. I think it was called In the Beginning and it's about the, uh, the first actual people who came over before the Mayflower, before the idea of pilgrims, which is also a fake idea that didn't come up till 50 years after everything. I think it was like around 18, no, way after. It was like a couple hundred years later, maybe in the 18, early 1800s, the term pilgrim even came about. So the first people who actually came, they had a horrible winter. Um, things didn't go well for them. So they had to basically start digging up Native American graves and eating corpses. So I think, it's just <laughs> well, well, yeah, I agree. Um, <laughs> better things to do than that. But they didn't know how to hunt because these, most of these people were wealthy. They didn't know how to hunt. They didn't know how to do anything. They, they, they basically just arrived here thinking that this was the promised land and everything was going to work out. And then they're like, oh, OK. And winter hits, very severe winter. And I, and I, and I think that, that in the beginning, like I, that's why I call it that, is that this first interaction between these two people is like a cannibalistic one. That it's actually eating them. It's actually consuming them. And that this would be the trend for, in this relationship to this day. Um, so when I made this piece around that same time, someone had was questioned whether or not it was factual. And just at that time, someone who was actually looking at that encampment and they found like a child's skull and had been scraped out because they were eating their children. Um, cannibalism is a big part of early American history, actually. So time passes. We get out of school, come to New York, getting ready to do my first show. I'm a little bit nervous. Well, I'm a ton nervous and stressed out. And I start, I, I'm actually tutoring this musician's son. And one day I'm sitting there with him and we're having a chit chat. He actually had a guy who would come in on Tuesdays and they just sit around and talk about history. And I was sitting there for lunch and I was talking about the Hell's Kitchen, one person believed, someone had said that Hell's Kitchen was named by Davy Crockett, but that's actually not true because it doesn't fit into the timeline of the naming. But the guy says to me, well, you do know that Davy Crockett actually was like surrendered at the Alamo. And I was like, oh, no, I didn't know that. He's like, yeah, he was surrendered and he was captured and he was taken back to Mexico and he actually was put on trial there and then he was beheaded. And I was like, what? So I start looking into it. So I jump from Ben and I jump into Davy. Um, Davy from the Wild Frontier, and Davy Crockett is an interesting character because for many people, maybe not your parents or maybe your grandparents, their generation, Davy Crockett was a TV character. He was like this idea of the, the rugged individual American who then later become a statesman. You know, he's very similar in the same vein to, um, to my friend Ben over here. And I start just kind of like reading about it. And there's one book called Blood of Heroes, another one called um, What God Had Wrought, um, which is these really beautiful large tomes that just talk about Manifest Destiny, talk about early America, talk about the individuals who were actually at the Alamo and how many of them were tax dodgers and kind of like slavers at some point and, you know, great folks. And I decided to, uh, well, that's actually what Davy Crockett looked like most of the time. Davy didn't really do this. Like Davy, was kind of, he would do that for people when he would go to write, do like book signings. He would dress up in the leathers and he'd have his gun and all that kind of stuff. But this is Davy Crockett. He was actually called, considered a dandy in his day and that he like really loved to wear like, you know, really fine linens and, you know, look sharp, I mean, for the day. And, uh, I, and so when he actually ends up at the Alamo, he ends up there because he tried to make another run to, I think, believe for Congress and he wasn't able to make it. So he decided to kind of go to Texas because he felt that there was a chance to kind of get some of his like old um, story or narrative back. So he kind of goes down there and just accidentally ends up at the Alamo actually. Um, other ideas around the Alamo, 
this kind of reclaiming of it. Davy Crockett played by uh, John Wayne. These little false setups of what the structure looked like. There he is with this coonskin cap. This is a, a rendition with Billy Bob Thornton where they actually kind of try to do a more truthful adaptation of it where they surrender and he's like beheaded. So I started making paintings kind of a, around the idea of surrender, the idea of, in our culture and with warfare, this, this, this tie in American history that keeps happening. If you research the Vietnam War and the supposed like torpedo shot that went towards a, a, little, a small boat that never really happened or over and over and over again, we find that there's these moments where like America finds a way to be a victim. Really right now what this president's doing by kind of like playing up a situation between us and the, the media or us and these brown people who are gonna eventually do something to us. Like it's setting up the, the track for us to then find ourselves as the victim again um, in the situation totally not thinking about any of the history or any of the other political things that we've done or all the governments we've overthrown and all that other stuff. So I, start, I thought like what would it be to just kind of talk about what if Americans can surrender? Like what if we can actually just say, I don't got this. Or like, I don't wanna die. I don't wanna be valiant. Like I actually wanna live. And that's something, I, I mean, how many movies have you ever seen about Americans like doing that? You know, like why not? What is wrong with that? What is it to say that maybe I was wrong and I, and I actually want help? So these paintings were also done in the black on black style, kind of highlighting these white kind of gloss, very like, I believe sensuous surfaces. I was at least attempting that. My portrait of Dave. This one's called uh, Texas Barbecue. It's uh, around the story of how uh, after Santa Ana like went through Mexico, or went to the Alamo, he, like, he waved this red flag that basically meant that like nobody lives. And then after they um, raided the Alamo on a beautiful uh, morning, uh, full moon night actually, good for me, um, they then stacked everyone up into a giant pyre of wood and bodies and just burnt everyone to the ground. And so there's just a pile of ashes of all that were left. And this little like, large drawing that I made, which is a little bit smaller than this actually, um, around it is acetone prints um, of the same image and it's just this idea of like the cyclical nature of all this violence. And, and I started just kind of making both sides werewolves and just kind of like trying to say like the curse is kind of within everyone. Uh, this one's called Tonto's Got Smart. Um, it's about like the Lone Ranger and Tonto's relationship and what if just Tonto just said, you know what, this ain't working. So. I just, you know, I wanted just to depict that and depict it in multiple ways and depict it in that way that, you know, changing the scenery slightly, you know, just like multiple days out on the range where he's just like, you know what, this guy, I ain't, I ain't, this isn't working. And um, so that was my little, it was like post that show. I was just like, I, I need color. And all of a sudden I just like, yeah, I went from that black and white and all of a sudden I was like, I want color, real color again. Another Tonto got smart. And this one, the horse is kind of in on it in the last one. Um, he's kind of like, you know, this up. So yeah, I started making kind of garish things, trying to figure stuff out. And um, you know, some were successful, many were not. And that happens a lot. You, you have to be ready to fail people. It's good to fail. You learn from failing. So this painting is uh, Death on a Pale Horse by Benjamin West. It's a massive painting. It's a glorious painting. It's at PAFA. It's one of my favorite things I've ever seen. Benjamin West, if you've seen most of his portraits or his paintings, um, they're kind of always very stiff and kind of dull and they're of like, you know, somebody from the revolution or there's somebody's horse that's real famous or something stupid. But in this painting, he was commissioned to do this like end of the world Armageddon painting. And actually PAFA's endowment was like tied to this painting, which I think at the time was like $17,000. And this painting is, you see this guy's strokes. You see his ambition in this painting. You actually see somebody swinging way above their, pay, like their, their physical ability, where like the strokes are underneath it. It's like, it's abstract in some ways when you're actually really close to it. And it's, and it's just, and then just death, I mean, well, that's actually, uh, yeah, death on the horse, like coming over with like lightning shooting out of his hands. It's like, that's just so crazy and badass. Um, it's painting's probably about, four times the size of this image. So it's just, yeah, I think it's like the white buffalo in the background. I mean, it's like, 
end of the world stuff, really good. So that got me all amped up. Um, because I had been working on uh, my general project of thinking about history and thinking about Manifest Destiny, and it kind of was back in the, the, the 19th century, and it was always kind of dealing with the antebellum, which is so kind of, it happens a lot actually with, with African American artists to kind of talk about that period of time, because a lot of incredible stuff happened. And, but I was like, well, my narrative, like where do I sit? Who do, how do I speak to what I'm actually interested in? I know there's something today that I need to actually be attached to. So I kind of had to, figure out, okay, what's the end of my story? And I'm like, well, if it's gonna be an American story, the end of my story is the end of the world because we live in a culture that is constantly obsessed with the end of the world. It's constantly obsessed with its own destruction, constantly obsessed with it falling apart and being there for the end times. You know, there's, there's a huge contingency of people in our government who are really support the state of Israel because they have this idea that if you rebuild the wall, then like God will come down and the end times will come. It's, it's there. It's really scary and messed up. Um, so I was like, yes, that's the story that I want to tell for the end of it. So I started to kind of paint these, and yes, there's my death, and there's, um, there's a conquest, which is Alexander Jackson, or Andrew Jackson, sorry. Andrew Jackson, amazingly horrible person. He's the reason why we have Florida. He, he kind of, <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you're from there, you know what I'm talking about. But there's... There's this thing where he ends up going into Florida because he's supposedly chasing runaway slaves and he gets pretty much he's fighting like the Spanish that actually owned Florida at the time. And as he's coming down, he just starts taking Florida. And then he writes to the president like, I think we have Florida now. And so they're like, oh, Andy. And, and so that's the story of Florida. Um, George Washington is my war and then my pestilence is like, uh, a cowboy with um, smallpox blankets um, riding around. So, yeah, so I, it was kind of like, great, I have an ending. I have an ending for this, this thing that I believe in uh, and this, the story that I'm trying to tell. I don't know what story I'm actually trying to tell. I'm just like putting the pieces together or I'm just like adding them to the world. I, I don't know where the gravity in this world is. I don't know what the plants look like. I don't know what the light looks like, but I'm just going there with it. So this is uh, the first in my text paintings. So I started making these text paintings, some monsters in large, because I felt that painting at that period of time was everything was going to going to this like bland overall abstraction space of just kind of like, I mean, I used to make big blue abstraction paintings before I went to Yale. And I just loved the idea of the sublime and being there present with it. But then after a while, the language around it just kind of got really hokey and, and, and people weren't really going any further with it. They weren't really pushing the idea. So, I, you know, this is of course, you know, Trayvon Martin was happening, you know, Black Lives Matter was really starting up. And I started thinking about this idea of like some monsters loom large, like these, these things that are just underneath the surface that are constantly here that we always are engaged with, that are always kind of messing with us um, in this culture. And, and, I, and I, so I was like, you know what? I'm, I wanna put text in painting. I wanna put letters in painting. I'm gonna put words in the paintings. I'm gonna do that taboo thing where you put words in paintings that direct people and tell them what you actually think and not just give them kind of BS, you know? So I, I, so I started doing it and, and it felt good. It felt great um, because I wanted to actually have a conversation. See, I didn't know that at the time. I, I didn't realize like, like there were some paintings when I didn't like them, it was because nothing ever happened. I didn't end up having a, a talk with someone about it. So with that Alamo stuff, like no one talked to me about it and I was like losing my mind. I had read over like a thousand pages on the Alamo and I could tell you crazy weird stories about Bowie getting stabbed in the chest with a, a knife and then it had broke off in his chest and he killed a man, like it was crazy. And it's like, but no one wanted to know. So I'm just sitting there with this bubbling. And I, and I go to an old professor of mine and I say to him like, I, I just wanted to talk to people. I just wanted to have a conversation. He's like, oh baby, you don't understand. That's the art world. Um, and, and I said, if you know who the guy is, he sounds just like that. And I, it, it kind of, I had to have a, I had to have a, a different, it was another level of conflict, not just about making something. And I was like, oh man, I want to talk to people too? Damn, like why can't I just make a painting? Uh, so I started to engage in it and started thinking about them more as like book covers as opposed to poster covers. I started thinking about this idea of duration and like the time that one spends with something, how something can evoke that sense of time. 
Um, another way to slow people down, other than just a black on black, but maybe I can do it with just odd senses of complexity. Uh. So this one's called Searchlight. Um, if you look inside the painting, it's a bunch of protesters getting the crap kicked out of them. And that's when this thing started popping up, the end is nigh, like these signs that say the end is nigh. Um, I'm trying to think, maybe this was around Ferguson when I did this piece. I mean, it's like, it's so crazy to think there's just so many events that happened in those like two, three years. Every, almost every day there was something new, something old and something new. So this piece, uh, that's that. I made that the night that uh, the cops that murdered Eric Garner got off. And um, it was really tough because I like, you know, I'm old enough to have seen a lot of stuff and been around, you know, be really aware as a child when, when uh, Rodney King happened. But there was something about being an adult male with the same body type as this man who was murdered that really struck a different chord for me. And so I was up at like 3 a.m. in the morning and I'm just sketching things and I'm just like so overwhelmed and I just did this drawing and I was like, that's that. And it was like, not, what it meant for me was just like, I, can't, I don't have any reason to be afraid anymore. I don't give a crap. Uh, it's being recorded, so I don't say what I normally would say. But I just realized that at any time, some psycho or some jerk off can just take my life. So what do I got to be afraid of? I just got to live my life the best I can. I got to be happy. I got to choose to be with the people I want to be with. I got to choose to have the friends I want to have. I got to choose to say what I want to say, when I want to say it, how I want to say it. Because some idiot could just like that. So that's that. That's the game. That's the awareness. That's the reality that I live in. Total acceptance. Game on. Let's do it. So from that point on, I just started drawing like feverishly and just saying like, no, no more governor. No more, no more little voice in my head that says like, no, that's not going to be good. Or no, no one will like that. Oh, no, no. Like, it was just like, that guy was like dead and buried. He was just gone. And it was just like, all right, I want to do magic spells. I want to get into all this other stuff. You know, like I'm conjuring. And, and uh, so then I started my painting changed all of a sudden. All of a sudden it was like ideas that I kind of had had for a very long time, they just started to like come out of me. And so this one's called That's That Fall. Um, this other one's called Distorted Sense of Self, uh, where the Sun Monsters Loom Large is actually backwards and upside down. There's a little sky rider, it's like written in the sky that the world is effed up. And I just started, because I've been like, I want people to understand that I'm afraid of you. You get it? Like my six foot three, like 250 pound body. Yeah, I'm strong. Yeah, I'm big. But I'm actually scared of you. I'm scared of what you would do. I'm scared of your afraid reaction, how that could actually kill me. <laughs> so I want you to understand that I got issues because of you. And I want you to feel that too. And uh, I started delivering it. So around this time, I start working on a secret project. I start taking all those drawings and start putting them together. And at night, my girlfriend's asleep and I'm drawing and I'm kicking things together. And my studio, I ended up locking my door to my studio and never let my, anyone in the studio know what I was doing in there. I, would I started having different hours. I started like living by night, you know? And, uh, okay, I'm already kind of a night owl, but yeah, you know what I mean. So I was doing it and I started to make a book. And it was weird because I, well, the book comes out of two things. It comes out of the idea that I've always wanted to make a book, but I, I didn't think I could. And then uh, at the time I was working for Kara Walker, and one day we're sitting there talking about, um, I think we were talking about Leila Lee's work, and we were talking about making a book and making comics, and, and I said to her, like, well, you could obviously make a comic, Kara. And she's like, no, I can never make a comic. And she's like, you can make a comic. And I'm like, no, I can never make a comic. She's like, you should make a book. And I'm like, well, you should make a book. And she said, you should make a book. And I said, OK, you're right. Because you're Kara Walker, and you're way smarter than me. So I'm going to do what you said. So I make a book. <laughs> you know, I'm like, it's like, it's like, that's the moment when like, it's trying to hit you, or the lightning's trying to tell you something. And I'm so dumb, I'm like, eh, you know, like, get away from me, lightning. And so I, and I, so I start just going home and I just start drawing and I just start doing, spitting out these drawings and then by the end of it, I have all these characters 
and I have all these like names for them, and my drawing skills got a lot stronger over time, and, and then I'm like, I'm drawing the way that my, my fifth grade art teacher like would, would yell at me for, <laughs> you know, like all of a sudden I'm doing it and I'm just like up at night and they're just popping out of me. Um, so the storyline of the first book, Some Monsters Loom Large, it's basically about this character who wakes up in kind of a limbo state, eh, let's call it Miami, and he, <laughs> while, while he's down, while he's there in this limbo, he gets, he sees this thing, this kind of like monolith with horns, which for me is this thing called Demon Mountain that I use a lot in my work. Um, and he swims out to it, he ends up climbing it and going inside of it, and he starts to explore it, and then this other side starts to happen where you realize there's a character inside of him, which is this small worm, and the small worm is an inheritor of this, like, this duty to try to like, kill this creature, or kill like, our main character. And so he's constantly just trying to like, find where this rhythm or where this beat is coming from and how he has to stop that beat. And uh, the characters kind of presented the, the world um, for the first time and kind of told about what, what's actually happening. And he gets to see my favorite old like, pilgrim eating uh, a Native American. And this like, manifest destiny monster is kind of birthed out of that. And then he's transformed in that into the werewolf. And then the werewolf then starts to enslave people. And he transfers his curse onto these bodies. And then kind of the uh, westward expansion, like crushing people under all, all of that, transforming them and crushing them. There's my little beholder guy. Um, so these things, as I started to come up with them, they weren't like something I was writing out. It just started flowing from me and I just started going with it. And sometimes it would be a whole section of drawings that would later end up at the end of the book. And then there some, would be some things that would come at the front of it and get intermixed and some things would just get tossed in the trash. So the beholder is actually an image from probably when I was like in high school or something, obviously, come on, look at it. Um, <laughs> but it was this idea, this one part in the storyline where the character's being like ripped through like a metaphysical space and there's just this silent character just sitting there just watching it, like this non-vocal, non-hearing, but just a seer, like someone actually seeing something from the outside. Um, and then, and the way that painting was actually rendered, the color's a little off, but at the top of it, in the stars, it says some monsters loom large as well above that. So this is the drawing and that's the painting. And the paintings are about 60 by 40 inches. I freehanded those circles, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So I just, so it was like, then this, this new thing started happening. I'm doing drawings and the drawings are uh, informing the paintings. Like for the first time in my life, like I'm actually like working in this scene where like these things are actually telling each other what's happening and, and giving me, this, I don't know, this clarity through working it. Yeah, that's at the Alamo, get all the stuff. So, and I was like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go back to the Alamo. It was horrible being there, but I'm gonna try it again. I'm gonna try to figure it out for myself and I can finally put it to bed. Well, during the story, he ends up finding another wolf guy and the wolf guy has this like little weird like character who's like a lump on a log. So it's kind of like uh, Nigger Jim and Huckleberry Finn, you know? Um, but then Huckleberry Finn turns out to be a monster that tries to kill the char main character and um, actually gets the other werewolf to kill our main character. He's constantly dying and, and coming back to life. He's constantly like living these cycles. Um, the ghost. So the ghost for me goes way back. It's, for me the idea about the ghost, it, I find in protest, I, I was really always excited. You don't know when you go to your first protest how it will go. And for me, one of my first real protests was back um, with Amadou Diallo, you know, against Giuliani, that piece of garbage, and how he, you know, kind of had a police force that was really doing some heinous stuff and then, you know, hey, it's gonna happen again, right? So we were out there and everyone's yelling F Giuliani and everyone's saying, you know, all these amazing chants and they're kind of going on and on. And in this rhythm, you start to realize that these statements, th these, these things that are being said, they've been said 
for like years, for, for, for maybe centuries, you know, like this kind of rhythm to it and that you actually at that moment are kind of possessed, that you're standing in the same shoes and the same actions as other people who wanted to see change happen, who wanted to fight injustice. And so I think about these ghosts like that is like this kind of this veil or this thing that you kind of take on and then you start to enact and you give yourself over in a protest in a lot of ways to other people. There's a vulnerability that's there, that's shared. I mean, that's why the Women's March was such a, a major thing, I think, around the world. And for those who decided to participate, and some people that decided not to, so be it. But I think for those who decided to show up to these certain towns where, I mean, 20,000 people marching in Houston to me, it seems insane. Like, it's Houston. That's like, it's Houston. And, you know, people in Miami were doing it. People in Miami, they don't do anything, man. They just, you know, they don't. They really don't care. But they cared. And to see that people were willing to give themselves over to, like, put th their cause aside to fight something greater than themselves, I find that to be an amazing thing, um, to choose to be possessed by the rest. Um, this one's called So Slips the Knot. It's about the uh, creature's about to kill him one more time. This one's called They Take Heads. So at the end of my story, my character's been traumatized from getting bumped around throughout history and being murdered multiple times. And so he ends up kind of in modern day New York City in a dumpster and he wakes up and he, he just like immediately just takes like a, a sign, uh, a thing of paint and he, he makes a sign for himself and then he like joins a protest with everyone else. And then as that happens, like, you know, he starts fighting with cops and people are getting mangled and, you know, travesty is occurring. And then all of a sudden this large sound happens and it's the first time in the whole book that sound actually occurs um, outside of the little worm narrator. And the, it's basically the end of the world. And so the four horsemen come down and everything, we never got it right in time. And basically people are just, you know, paying the price. I was raised Southern Baptist, but I'm not a religious person, but it's, yeah, I guess it crops up. Grandma was right. Um, <laughs> It'll happen, you'll see. Um, <laughs> dancing death. And so these are these like large watercolors that I made. And that's supposed to be um, Florida a and I kind of like fam use marching band. <laughs> I kind of wanted to have them in there. My dad's a rattler. Um, so using high intense color, things that kind of push the eye out rather than push the eye in. So this image, as you may know, is from The Force Awakens. This image is from a book in 1953. Um, I believe it was Strange Fantasy. Sorry if I'm wrong on any of these names. I'm kind of at that point in the lecture when it gets a little foggy. So this image is of um, the story basically where a, a spaceman comes down to a planet to ask these robots to be a part of the Federation of Planets. It turns out the, the robots are actually racist, that they, um, there's blue robots and there's orange robots, and orange robots can't do you know, what black people can't do. And so at the end of it, he um, ends up taking off his helmet, and then he's like, it reveals at the end of it that it's a black man, and how he's like beautiful, and he's mythical, and he has stars in his skin, and, and it's like you know, so sad that these, primitive robots haven't been able to evolve to a higher level of consciousness, you know, that kind of thing. And at the time that book was, was banned, um, the, the beginning of the, uh, the Comic Codes Authority had started, and it was kind of like a McCarthyism that was going on in the comic books community, where it was trying to get rid of like violent images, werewolves, vampires, and black people. And so <laughs> that was true. They actually didn't want blacks in comics. So he um, saw this image and he was like, no, 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 this can't happen. It was actually a reissue. It already had been put in the world before the Comic Code Authority came around, but when it's coming up again, he was like, no. And so Ed Gaines, uh, who was the head of um, Erie Comics, got on the phone with the, uh, the, uh, the judge, cursed him out a bit, hung up the phone, and he was like, you know, you just have to take this figure out. And he's like, no, I'm not doing that. Boom, hangs up the phone. Then the judge calls back and says, well, you can run the image, but you gotta take the stars out of his skin. Like, isn't that crazy? Like, this judge understood that symbolism? Like, he got that? Like, he saw that power in that comic book? You know? And so when this image of Force Awakens, in that first scene, when, like, it all of a sudden, like, you hear 
the, uh, oh God, I'm going to mess up the line. I'm a nerd. I'm going to mess up the line. But it's like, but it says like, you know, there's been a disturbance of force. The force is wicked. You know, that, that thing it says all ominous. And then the first thing you see is a black stormtrooper. And so a lot of people got freaked out about seeing a black stormtrooper because in the canon of the storyline, it's basically they're this other body and they're not a black body. And it's not a black body. Like black bodies in, in sci-fi have to be secondary characters or they're like, they're played by aliens typically, you know, like <laughs> we, that's what makeup is for. We don't have to actually get a black guy. So I saw this like this, I was already reading about this and this crush kind of happened. And so I'm sitting around talking with my friend Will Bolongo about, well, black representation in, in contemporary art, kind of noticing that image, figurative imagery was a returning to painting, and yet black artists were not being a part of that conversation. It would have kind of always run to Peter Saul, but then you wouldn't talk about other individuals. You wouldn't see like Carrie James Marshall in that conversation. You wouldn't even see Carol in that conversation. You would just kind of like, that's another space, but we're gonna be over here doing like this stuff. We'll talk about the Chicago images, but we won't talk about anybody else. Nobody in LA was making anything at that time. You know, and I, I just was like, um, Screw that. So he said, we should do a show. And I said, I don't want to do a show. And he said, you should do a show. And, and I was like, lightning bolt, boom. And then we start working on the show Black Pulp. So, so Black Pulp opened um, early 2016. It took about a year and a half to get everything together. Um, it's amazing how many historians really want you to put jigaboos and sambos in your show. It's like, I kept asking them, hey, could you have anything, you know, like, let me see what you have. And they're like, oh, but this is something special. I'm like, oh, is he eating watermelon? That's so special. I've never seen that before. <laughs> like, tell me, you know? And, I, and it's like, that is, is a part of this weird linear thinking, this weird linear canon of representation that people keep doing to it themselves and to each other. And it's like, we can snap that. So when I started working on the book, I mean, working on the, the show, we started finding images. We started talking about Langston Hughes and we started reading Fire and we started talking about, um, you know, finding that there was a strong sense of queer identity and like in life politics in the 1930s that were kind of like smushed by another, the middle class black and the upper middle class black community. And the W.E. Du Bois want to be 10%. So there was like, you know, and it's like, and it's, it's like, and I'm not saying that to say like to deride them, we all have to come together in some way and have to have a common cause, but there was this, this sensibility where people, what is high and what is low? What is seen, what is unseen? What is discussed, what is not discussed? And then finding that in, in these books that we started using and started finding um, for the show, we started finding that it was about artists and, and community. The, the one thing I'll stress is that Emory Douglas and the Black Panthers, like speaking for all these people, speaking for a movement, thinking about how do you actually depict that information. You don't do it just by, I'm just gonna do it this way. He listens to people, he talks to people, he's in the community and he's actually dealing with people and dealing with the subject. He doesn't see himself as just being the focal point of it, he sees himself as a part of it. He's that ghost, he's the inhabitor of that thing. That's the most important part. That's what I kept finding inside of these books, was that people sometimes would turn themselves over and they would say, I'm gonna do, um, like Jackie Orme's doing Torchy Brown, which is like the first black female comic artist doing the fa first black female character, which is like the 1940s. You know, and, and talking about a black middle class African American woman who's working a day job who wants to find love and actually be a, a, a three dimensional human being. People were doing it. People have been doing it, it's just that they don't get risen to the top. They don't become a part of the conversation. So we had to do a lot of deep digging. With that, we also want to have contemporary art. So we have um, Belanda Stames, we have uh, Derek Adams, we have uh, Ellen Gallagher, and we have Robert Colescott. And a lot of the images we were looking for, you know, sometimes it did kind of play into some things that were a little bit known, but then I think other times we're talking about, you know, um, Afrofuturism or talking about intimacy was something also we wanted to try to touch on too. This piece, basically the piece is about um, these two young um, black men who are noticing that they can't enter in the space and he's basically saying like, you know, look, when my dad was in the military, you know, it was okay and fine for him to hang out and eat food and stuff like that, but I guess when there's no more Germans around, you know, it goes back to being the way it was. Um, this artist in particular, his major um, idea in drawing black bodies, he also did this comic strip called Dark Laughter um, about Harlem, was like, how do I depict African-Americans 
in a way that is humorous without being derogatory? How do I find that line? How do I cultivate my ability to actually do that work? So we got some amazing things. We got original editions of New Negro, original editions of Crisis, Opportunity, things that a lot of people had never seen all together in one space. And then, um, yeah, so the show's traveling to University of South Florida now, and then it might go to Detroit, and then it might go to Wesleyan College, and, so, and then it might even go to DC. So it's just this kind of side thing that keeps growing and keeps moving and keeps me alive and keeps me aware. So th my new book, because I don't usually talk about something when it's in the pressure cooker. It's called Early Retirement. So I started Early Retirement back in August. And the idea was that I had been thinking about utopia a lot. And why can't we work on utopia? Or why no one ever talks about a world without war anymore? Or why do we still stay in the space of like this nosedive towards um, Armageddon? So I started trying to play with the characters I'd used before and try to figure out like, OK, so I have this angel character from my first story who's like the drummer. And the drummer's fed up with like having to kind of enact the end of the world and it never really happens. And then I have my main character, who's this crazy person who wears a foil hat, who always like is, you know, like telling everyone the world's coming to an end. And so I started making this book and I started drawing it, and I knew the election was coming up. And I, so I left this part blank, and I still leave it blank <laughs> because I just don't want to, yeah. I think that explosion is enough, that little pop. So he leaves the bar and he's lamenting this thing, ends up yelling at God, he gets hit on the head with ball lightning, gets transported to this other dimension where he ends up falling down and finds truth. There's these zigzag patterns that kind of go back to, um, <laughs> it's an African symbol um, about energy and power and lightning and universal power. So it's kind of like he's finding that truth through that. While he's there, he ends up opening up this box and then he's like transported into this world where he actually finds the truth. He comes back with the truth. He ends up getting a bunch of followers. They end up building a giant barricade in the middle of the streets in a city. It breaks the flow of traffic and then everyone's kind of angry and frustrated, but everyone who sees the word keeps coming to them. They all become followers. Eventually, they all decide to turn on them and then they are about to execute them. And then the angels come down and the end of the world starts to occur. And then as that's all going down, a giant tidal wave comes in and wipes out New York City because, hey, global warming is beyond everyone else. So then it just annihilates everything. And so then two characters end up back at Limbo, South Beach, and they're talking to each other about that desire to create that space between two individuals and how what I want, my utopia, can look very similar to your utopia, but trust me, there's gonna be some odd differences. And then we try to put those things together. If we don't have the ability to communicate with one another, if we have a way to be vulnerable with one another and have empathy for one another, then we are always gonna end up in the same situation. We always will destroy each other. So I'm trying to figure out a way through drawing, <laughs> Because that's what I do, right? That's who I am. That's, that's, what I that's what I do. Try to figure out how do I open that conversation. Hit on the head, wakes up, tosses out the sign, and then finds a new, new way to, to work. Um, I think about, and I've, talking to, I've spoken to a lot of older artists. I actually spend my time speaking to older artists because I think it's really important because they have so much to, to offer, not, not opportunities, but like real stuff, you know, real stuff. And there was an artist who was speaking to me and it said, for 20 years, I would talk about this relationship of history and violence in, in the black body and, and, and African Americans. And I would talk at these conferences and no one would really understand me. 20 years later, a young woman walks up and she's speaking to it. She understands it. So I'm saying is that what we're doing as artists, a lot of the ways that we're trying to communicate with people today may not seem that there's actually doing the work. But in time, if you continue to do the work, it will come back. It will reflect itself. You will move on. So that's me. <laughs> Questions? Anyone? Come on. I know some of you. I'll talk to you this Friday if you didn't ask a question. Yeah, it's okay to ask a question. Um, 
One question is, um, I, can I ask two? Yeah, um, sure. No one else is really in. Well, it. if they. <laughs> one question is, I was just curious about, like, you were talking about the um, way that language started coming in, this mm -hmm. direct speech that sort of implies dialogue or address, a, yeah. a direct address, um, mm -hmm. which could have an answer or a response. And, um, but then the comic book pages seems like they've withdrawn from that, like that mm -hmm. they're almost like, they reminded me a little bit of um, certain panels of what's his face, who's about to have a show at the new museum. S Pettibone. Yeah, Pettibone in a Pettibone, way. Yeah, yeah. But like his like thing is like so like loaded with this murmur. Yeah. And I noticed that your language then recedes to a space of like ab absence. Yeah. And so one th that's one question. I don't know which question you might want to. Well, I mean, early on when doing it, I, I really wanted it to be about every drawing and about every image. And so in the first book I made, it was actually one to one for every image and every drawing. And I, I kind of emptied out language because I wanted people to see if I could actually build something up through imagery over time and actually create a track and try to see if people would actually kind of be able to follow it, you know, if I can actually just let the images do the work. And I think that it, with language, that's why I only have that one character who uses language, because he ha he's the one who's determined. He's the one who actually knows his stake. He actually knows his purpose, so he's the only one who can really kind of speak to it, where everyone else is sort of moving through it and experiencing it and looking at things and feeling those things. So I just wanted to see if I can get into that mode, if I could bring people into that zone. Now with the new book, it, I think there's probably going to be a little bit more language. It's going to be a little bit more directed. But as I'm actually generating the images, I'm just not concerned about like speech bubbles and, and that kind of thing. I'm really kind of like still really just nestled in that image making and what that can communicate. It's, it's tough because I, I start writing more now and I start giving them voices and they, I hear their voices um, individually now more than I did before. So it's like, that's why I feel at the end of the book, it's going to be a kind of a conversation between the two of them, between the actions that they were trying to do in the world versus what their actual mental intentions were. Yeah. Someone over there? Someone over there? Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your character of uh, the beholder, because mm -hmm. it seems a lot different than some of the other characters you're putting in. Like, it's, it's like, do you think of him? Do you think of the character as like passive, or like, what is, what is the role of the beholder in your world? It's like, for me in that story, the beholder was sort of something that came out of my own experience of what I knew I needed to actually kind of become in this world. It, it's weird. I talk a lot. You might have noticed, and. I think sometimes I talk around things and I'm not present and I'm not aware. So the beholder is someone who I wanted to just be s completely in a state of awareness. Just there, just being present and like kind of putting him on that bedrock floating in space, that kind of like moment where he's just seeing this horrible thing kind of occur. Um, so that's why I was kind of, I, that's how I ended up using that character, yeah. Far distance. Hi, Mark. Um, can you talk a little bit about the way you approach drawing versus painting? Um, and um, are your paintings, are they acrylic or are they acrylic. oil? Does that have anything to do with like, the, f the, the, the way in which comic books look and like the aesthetic that you've chosen to? Yeah, th I mean, there's been a real in the beginning, there was a huge fight for me between like the line and how far easily something can fall into being comic, and how easily someone can see something as just being a comic book, and then kind of being like low, um, low culture or something like that. Then I just kind of was like, I don't care. But um, I, the secret is, is that I don't actually think of them as paintings. I think of them as drawings. So I actually execute them thinking like drawing thought and drawing space. So that's why there's sort of a one-to-one. -one. That's what I actually discovered when I was doing the black on blacks. The black on blacks are all oil paintings, but the way that they're actually executed, they're executed more like a drawing. 
space. So then I just accept what color can do to create space versus thinking about color. I don't know. I mean, that's how I just think about it. So when I execute drawing, or maybe more like um, edge to edge thinking about color, is that one thing can sit next to it, that thing's gonna push and pull, that thing's gonna offer something. But I accept that, and then I just get to the drawing. <coughs> So most of my color situation is like, it's all mixed out, it's all worked out. I do like printouts of all the images, I use markers, I use paint, I use whatever to figure out my color sets. Then I go to my council of much smarter people than me and talk about that color. And then I like, and then, um, and then I like, then I come to the painting and when I come to it, I'm able to come to it completely there. Then I get to have the fun of just drawing it, like in that scale. But it's always been about drawing for me. Like it's it's my home. When I start to my brain flips into painting, it's another thing. It just looks like painting, but it's like. But basically, I found high flow mediums. I mix things in a certain way so I can still get them. I use sumi ink brushes to do everything. So it's like still all in the hand. It's the way I think about it. Question mark. <laughs> yeah. Here. <laughs> okay. Um, He's going to be tough. I know it. Come on. Well, I was thinking, a uh, mm -hmm. little aside to the audience, that um, there's, some, there's something to be said for the asking a hard question. Um, it's sort of almost like a sign of respect. I wish I had a hard question. Did um, I just say a lot of stuff? You do? My Ooh. Word? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll think of one and I'll come back. Um, I'm just curious, like as like a comic book enthusiast, what um, comic books influence you and how that affects like how your layouts, like because you just have like a very unique sort of comic book sense. Um, I'm just curious. Um, I would say. Hmm. The sensibility is to kind of like pick up everything and kind of look at a lot of stuff and look at old books from the 1940s and 50s and then also get contemporary stuff. For me right now, narratively, what I'm also very interested in is the comic book Invincible, just because the main character and like how death operates in that storyline or tragedy operates in that storyline, where things actually have consequence. And so um, it doesn't like get, everyone doesn't come back from the dead all the time and, and everything's not okay. And there's not just some stupid cataclysmic thing there's actual conversation that actually occurs in that book versus like, you know, I mean, I, I pick up Marvel books every once in a while and I'm just like, man, they're just hitting each other. Like, there's no story here. This is really ridiculous. It's like, it's a mess. So art wise, there's some stuff like David Aja, who did this run of Hawkeye. He's actually really amazing um, because it's small, it's tempo. Like he had this one issue where it was just sign language because both the main characters got their ears, um, guns went off or blasts went off so they couldn't hear each other. But as kids, they used to do sign language with each other. So the whole issue is in sign language and it doesn't attempt to teach you sign language. It just like, so you're just looking and you're just reading it and you're getting that information kind of to what you were saying, Amy. Like I wasn't, that, I read that later on, but it's like, yeah, like can that image do it? Can something actually take on that ambitious risk to figure that out? So. I do think that comic books have that ability to do that. I think that's why so many people are having conversations around comic books lately. And there's like a huge scholarship. I mean, it's, it's weird, but it's fun. Yeah, yeah, okay, so then a tangent on that would be just pretty much like that same question with your like sci-fi influences? Um, sci-fi influences as far as um, Alien, Alien 2, I saw that in the theater when I was like six years old and terrified the hell out of me. I, um, the Fly, Cronenberg. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I've always loved sci-fi, and I love sci-fi for a lot of reasons, science fiction for a reason. And I actually kind of came up last week in one of my classes, we were discussing sci-fi and science fiction, and a student brought that up. And, and it is true, I feel right now, that we are really in need for some real good science fiction. Because right now we're in a world of sci-fi BS and like exploding buildings and towers and, and false heroes saving everyone. What? Delaney. What? Samuel yeah, Samuel Delaney. You know, like, yeah, exactly. But it's like in writing there is still champions in that. But I feel like 
What Star Trek Next Generation was for me as a kid and what that actually meant as far as like how the characters interacted with each other and how things were worked out and there was a community there and how they were working towards something, you don't see that today, today in like modern sci-fi on television, science fiction on television. It's more or less like laser guns and fast cars and explosions. There's like, yeah, they still kind of use the Star Trek underlining thing where they're trying to talk about political issues or talk about Kleongs as Russians and that kind of stuff, but there's a different, but it's not Samuel Delaney. It's not that deeper threat. It's not Octavia Butler. It's not that other thing, which I think that's actually kind of what we need now. We need that kind of kindred moment and like the way that we re like see film and way that that kind of science fiction occurs. That's what I was thinking. But yeah, you're right in writing. Yeah, people got it. Mm-hmm. Um, so from comic books and, uh, and science fiction, this, uh, it's I'm trying to join some, some points together here. Um, mm -hmm. So Captain Marvel right now is a Muslim. Spider-Man is an African-American, same. Because the Captain Marvel copy, because she, think about it, like she's, how her inhuman powers kind of arise that she's not, she gets to house that space. Right, but right, 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 right. You know, Sam Wilson gets to hold the shield. Yeah. You know, go on. Well, yeah. I mean, Star Wars, you got Nicaraguans and African Americans and women in front, like th this thing. And you showed this first uh, paintings you did in which the black and black, uh, it just reminded me so much of uh, the portrait of the artist, as the shadow of, of his former self. Mm -hmm. um, and what, and how James Marshall is also dealing a lot with, uh, with comic book language and the depiction of of African Americans through this and how he resorts to to, to just painting eye, eyes and a, you know and a, and a mm -hmm. hat and then afterwards he does this comic book uh, can't remember the name Rhythm right Master now. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and then this this image you showed next to the John Boyega character uh, where that 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 same inking process which has been a huge trouble for depicting African American yeah. Um, my question is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, he brought everyone into the conversation of like this, the depth of this. Yeah. Stuff, yeah um, no. So, how, how's that been for you, as in, as in, relate like this particular subject, how it's been depicted? How are you still like engaging with the history of its depictions in both painting and? comic book illustration, I guess. Well, I, I think kind of like looking back to her, like Oliver Harrington, I try to depict people like people. And I think that's the line that I'm always trying to think about when I'm trying to draw something. I'm trying to not just make them like uh, goofy caricatures and the kind of that, that the world I, wor I live in is a little bit more physical and real, at least the one that I try to create, even though that main character is like a Wile E. Coyote-esque type thing. I, I, think about when I actually do bodies and I do black people and I do white people, I try to just draw them as people. Um, yeah, that's how I kind of think about it a lot. Yeah. Yes? Um, I'm not sure the microphone is working. Oh, oh, okay. Um, I was really interested in the image, That's That, yeah. which you described in relationship to an event in the real world, you mm -hmm. know, a really important event. And it just got me sort of spinning into, uh, or sort of imagining what would happen if some of your language was separate from a body. Mm. Because um, I guess I think um, one of the places I can kind of move around in the work is in that gap between <coughs> the body and the voice. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you, but the way you're talking about it is mostly tied to narrative. Like, Mm -hmm. The language is usually tied to some sort of um, narrative. Is that right? Yeah. But I mean, if you're having a moment with it where you feel like you can actually sit inside of it, that's fine. You know, like if there's a gap that you find inside of it that you can sit, that's cool. Yeah, uh, that particular piece stood mm -hmm. out for me, and I just wondered if it, if it was a different kind of approach than other works. Because a lot mm -hmm. of the work, I mean, we've been talking a lot about the comic tradition and um, which is usually narrative. Yeah. Um, and that particular, I don't remember if that was a drawing or a painting. Was that it a started drawing? as a drawing, then it became a painting. Yeah, I mean, 
there's a story there. Yeah. But you know, sometimes I just like some pages are just a cup. Some pages are, and it's and it kind of goes into this idea of like, oh gosh, it's gonna get nerdy. Uh, manga and other forms of comics where space is kind of broken up in different ways and there's different rhythms, so it's not something that's usually seen in the Western comics or Western traditions of looking at imagery like that in the comic world. So I can have moments like that where it is kind of a little bit more contemplative or where the moment where people kind of come into something. So when the show is up and all together and all the paintings are in a room, they are kind of speaking to one another. So they are kind of doing the same thing that, that's happening in the paintings where things kind of can slow down. And there are these open spaces and you don't know what's happening with the character and you just kind of either feel what's ominous or you feel like you're at the aftermath of something or you're at the moment when something just occurred. So I think about time a lot and the way you, I'm shooting it and the way I'm kind of producing it visually. But um, yeah, but uh, yeah, sometimes people can enter a space because maybe a body blocks them from entering the space. And maybe, you know, yeah, that's, that's, I can understand that. Or sometimes the body is, the, is you. You know, yeah. is the artist. I guess that's what, maybe that's what I was responding to in you don't that wanna, particular You want to take the place of my body? You don't want to be in my body or my footsteps or what? Uh, no, that isn't what I was saying. No, no, because it just, it just like we're talking about like owning space and being in space and thinking about space and thinking about the space that's happening inside the painting, like, right? Oh, or? I wasn't talking about owning space. I mean, maybe, maybe you are, I'm not. I was talking about visiting your space. Yeah. Like, how I was so, but I'm it, saying if I'm in wandering. that space, then you can't visit that space. No, actually, what I was saying was that I liked the fact that I could, in that particular piece, I felt like I was reading your voice directly. Okay. Um, that's all. All right. <laughs> Yo. So at the start of the evening, you um, floated the idea of false truth. Yeah. Uh, I think you even used the term masquerade. Uh -huh. And I think it was in association with some of the mythologies that have been spun around early American history, Ben Franklin and stuff like that. Yeah. But then it seemed also that you were uh, perhaps suggesting that it, there was possibility there as well. And yeah. uh, I'm just wondering, you know, throughout the trajectory of your work, um, if your idea about truth or how to use false truth, you know, metaphor, fantasy, et cetera, has changed, seems particularly relevant, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. we went from truthiness to uh, a few years ago to now we have like alternative facts. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't know if you can, if you can counter alternative facts with, with true facts or if you need to if, you know, maybe, I mean, as artists, maybe we're more at home in the realm of false truths than, than say, journalists and other politicians. Yeah. And maybe we can wield that as a weapon. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's an odd collective experience of how we, how we are actually viewing the world is what's actually butting up against this guy's sense of truth. Like, I think there's an obvious, like, rebuttal to like either a Chuck Todd when he's talking to Kelly, um, Kelly and, and, and saying like, no, that's not truth or that's not the way it works and, and actually stating that and trying to reassert that position. Like I think that there's a, a, a desire to do that and I think that's a kind of an amazing thing and I think it's great that people are doing it. And I, yeah, is the deluge of crap that they're gonna try to like stuff down people's throats gonna work? I don't know, because I do think that we have information and technology and the way we actually are communicating with each other on a certain level. I mean, yes, okay, Facebook does create like a weird system where they kind of aggregate us into small little columns and then we only see certain things, you know? And yeah, Google's doing the same thing, so there's a lot of stuff that's preying upon us and how our reality operates. But then maybe we have opportunities like this where we're just sitting around talking with each other and we can just be open with each other and I can hear what you have to say. Like, maybe we just have to do more work to kind of get around that. Thank uh.